go back here. 1679 and 1684, I explain why that's important and explain why I call it an atelier rather than a workshop. Because Newton was doing, I believe he was doing graphics. He was doing really working with uh, pencils and, and so on. And the, the point is, uh, all the papers, there are about 1,600 manuscripts that are available online. I mean, if you, if you put online Newton papers, you find beautifully collected in Cambridge University all the manuscripts with handwritten uh, manuscript of Newton from 1679 on. But there is a period of five years, and I'll tell you during the talk why this period was important, where all the papers have not been found. They're lost or maybe they were destroyed by Newton. And I believe that that's when he was, as we say, fiddling around trying to figure out the laws of motion. And the historians say, well, you know, too bad. We, we can't do anything about it. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you my own speculations of reconstructing what he might have been doing during that period that led him to his, uh, to his discoveries. Now, I'm sure that, uh, you know, these remarks of Laplace about how everything was so beautiful uh, and so on, uh, there is a well-known, there's now a book that probably is on many of your coffee tables that nobody probably really reads, but Chandra was tremendously impressed. He was a great as astrophysicist and he was so impressed. But until he was in his 80s, as my, my age, he had never really looked at the Principia and he was asked to give some remarks at the tercentenary. And uh, as he says, you know, he found so many remarkable things in that book that it absolutely floored him. He said he had an epiphany and, uh, and uh, claimed that he thought Newton was even superior to, to Albert Einstein. In some ways he was correct because Newton not only had to do all this fabulous amount of uh, work, he also had to do the math. He had to invent the mathematics to do it. So uh, it was pretty spectacular, but what we're going to hear, what I'm going to try to explain to you is how did he do that? I mean, how was he able to, uh, to make progress? Well, this is another uh, very good text. I think it's superior to Chandra Sekar's, written by uh, some of you may know who Routh was uh, in, uh, in the 19th century, also in which he converts, they, the two of them convert Newton's Principia is mainly written in a geometrical language. There are no calculus. I mean, very, very little of it. In fact, you have to really dig it. Uh, uh, how many of you have taken a look inside that, that book? Could I have a show of hands? Of, okay. And uh, how many of you have actually followed, followed the proofs in that book? <laughs> well, you look around and... No many, no many hands. The, the proofs are very, very <laughs> difficult. And they depend on an expertise that is no longer available to us, you know, reading Apollonius's Cornex and all that. Uh, and Chandra says, oh, it's well known. But <laughs> some of those theorems are, are not well known. And the proofs are, are very difficult uh, to follow. Even Richard Feynman, who you well know, actually confessed in a book that he couldn't follow Newton's proof of his famous proposition about elliptic motion uh, for inverse square forces. And he invented, of course, as his usual find when he had to invent his own. Okay, let me sit down for a moment. Because I got to stretch my head up to, to see what, oh yeah, I can read it on the, on the slide. <coughs> Yeah, uh, as I've said before, only very uh, advanced mathematicians could phantom the debts. And there was continuous this 
remarks in those days that maybe he discovered everything by divine revelation. I like the story about the students in Cambridge who said, there goes a man who wrote a book that even he doesn't understand. Uh, and Newton actually apparently remarked that he made the book difficult on purpose. It wasn't accidental that there were these difficulties because he was a very, a very haughty guy who uh, basically didn't want to be bothered with the hoi polloi. Only very advanced mathematicians should be able to read his, his great book. And I listed only five mathematicians in the 18th century who, after converting Newton's theorems into the calculus that Leibniz had developed, were able to you know, follow what he was doing. Uh, they're listed there. Uh, Leibniz, of course, independently, oh, well, that's a matter for historians still to dispute whether he independently discovered or developed the calculus. The calculus, of course, was neither developed, but neither discovered by Newton or by Leibniz. So it has a whole history of people who contribute this, like everything in science and mathematics. Uh, uh, people stand on each other's shoulders. Now, uh, many of you, no doubt, uh, know Richard Dalitz, a particle physicist who, who knew Chandra very well, and he organized Chandra's lectures in, uh, there's, there's Dalitz, he organized Chandra's lectures in, in Oxford before the book was published. And I met him at a conference, and I said, let's put together all the scholars who worked on Newton, and uh, let's have a meeting, and we had a meeting, and he organized, helped organize the meeting in the Royal Society. And I have a, you know, all the people, all the scholars who were, at the time, uh, contributed, lifetime contributions, uh, like, uh, I don't know if you know I.B. Cohen, uh, he's, a, he's a Harvard historian, he spent his entire life writing uh, on Newton's uh, Principia. And there is uh, uh, Rupert Hall. And, and very importantly is this guy here, uh, who uh, actually was the, the guy who, who actually sat down with all the manuscripts on Newton. And, uh, there are eight volumes that he has written, translating Newton, of course, whenever it was in Latin, and then copious footnotes. Uh, and uh, all the other historians who really didn't spend their time with the mathematics relied, relied on what he had to, what he said about Newton's, Newton's work. Uh, Feel free to interrupt or, or ask any questions. So uh, here's, here's Rupert Hall, who, who said the right thing. I mean, you know, these ideas didn't come from the head of Jove. But he gave up on the idea of trying to figure out how he developed them. And uh, it was actually uh, Cohen who described the fact that of all the manuscripts of Newton, the most interesting ones are the lost. And there are no manuscripts give you any clue. They're, they're, they're worksheets, you know, the stuff we all do when we certainly start working on a problem. And, you know, you piddle around, you don't immediately get to the final result. Mathematicians have followed in foot, Newton's footstep and they publish their theorems and their proofs, and they never give you much of a hint of how they got there. Or, and, and so Newton was one of the first to make it very difficult to. Well, uh, Cohen also throw, threw in the towel and said, we may never possible be certain of how he did it. <laughs> 
I want to dispute that today. I'm not, I, I won't say that we can be certain, but we can certainly build up a, a pretty plausible scenario on how he did it. And the surprising fact to me is that it's so elementary that you wonder why, why hasn't why nobody tried it. I mean, it's not very difficult. I think the guy who probably had the best insight in how Newton actually worked was an economist, neither a physicist or mathematician or a, but, a, uh, but an economist, uh, Keynes. And he said the Principia is dressed up. There's no resemblance at all how he did it. And when I read that, I said, well, what do economists know how physics gets done, right? <laughs> uh, well, actually, I think uh, it was Keynes who came closest to understand that what Newton actually did is very different to the way he presented it. Incidentally, uh, you may remember the statue that you saw on, on Chandra's cover is that the actual statue is looking away from, <laughs> from Newton's cover. Newton actually, I mean, Chandra actually had the mirror image so that Newton, the Newton would be looking at him rather than at <laughs> away from him. So he, but mirror image is important, and I will immediately show you why. Uh, I was invited some years ago to present some findings I had uh, in this case, about some work of Robert Hooke in England, and they gave me an honorarium. Uh, the, the, the talk I gave, I gave it to a bunch of high school students on the Westminster Abbey School. That's the oldest, one of the oldest schools in England. All the great men of England studied there, including uh, many famous scientists. And at the end of my talk, I was presented with this, with this pound. And as you can see, it has all the major uh, things that uh, you know, Newton has. Uh, you see the, the Principia in his hands, open on a page that actually, uh, of course he also worked on the theory of colors, he developed a telescope. And as you see here is his famous diagram of an elliptic orbit with the sun in the center. Well, well, the sun in the center? I, think, I thought we all learned that the sun is supposed to be on a focus of the lips, not on the center. This is not the correct proposition. Uh, somebody who created this, this thing, obviously created the, 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 this pound, <laughs> made a humongous blunder. This is proposition 10, not proposition 11, which is the relevant one. And that makes my pound a lot more worthy than <laughs> it would have been otherwise. The pound went out of circulation, naturally. Uh, oh, I'm always afraid I might hit the wrong... Uh, what did I do? Yeah, I hit the wrong button. I have to figure out how to get back. Anybody, any guru in the... How do we, how do we get this back to... Uh, uh, who is the expert on... I hate to push too many buttons, yeah. Can you get it back uh, on? Maybe. That's a great physicist. <laughs> Thanks. All right. I'll, I'll watch out and I don't push this wrong button. By the way, in addition to publishing a, uh, a pound, they also put out a, uh, a stamp. And this time around, the stamp has the right diagram. <laughs> 
This is an extremely important diagram because that was the proof that Newton needed to show that a, a, a particle on the surface of the Earth would be attracted as if all the mass was at the center. He didn't have that before, so he couldn't really do the moon test properly. And Newton was an extremely sharp scientist, physicist, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't do something that anybody else would have thought, well, this is, a, you know, this is not important. He realized that to compare the force on the moon with the force of gravity on the surface couldn't be done until the theorem, and he proved the theorem only later on. So this is a very important, it's, it's theorem 71, so you really have to go on and read further in the Principia. And, uh, Chandra correctly calls it the superb theorem. Now there is a portrait of Isaac Newton in the National Gallery, one of my favorite portraits, and uh, oops. And uh, when I saw it, I was very surprised at the caption, which referred to Newton again, referred to Newton having made his discovery by divine revelation. So when I got out of the gallery, I found there was a little place to make comments. And so I made a comment that Newton was a scientist, he wasn't a, a priest. My wife was furious at me, that you know, I waste your time. But I got a nice letter from the uh, curator who said to me, well, we're gonna change the, we're gonna change the caption and we hope you like, uh, like to change. They, they removed this, the nonsense that Newton had discovered, uh, uh, his theorems by divine revelation. Now we have to go to a man that uh, you probably all have heard of Hooke's Law, right? I mean, a spring and all that. And that's pretty much what I had learned when I was a student, that he had discovered that the force is proportional to the elasticity, the displacement. And Newton was the greatest scientist in, in uh, London uh, at the time. I mean, he was the soul and heart of the Royal Society. And every week, you know, he was creating experiments. He was, the, he was a absolutely a splendid scientist. But he got into a controversy with Newton on the theory of colors that I'm not going to be talking about. And, and Newton had a very thin skin. He didn't like, didn't like to be criticized. I mean, you know, you don't tell me, Isaac Newton, that I wasn't doing something right. And so, uh, now, uh, there's a rumor that when Hook died, that, I mean, there are no portraits of Rune. I mean, if you go to London, there are statues and portraits of, Lu of Newton all over the place, you know. Tons of them in the National Gallery, in the Royal Society. There is no portrait of Robert Hook, in contrary to some books that have been published that claim uh, uh, to have a picture of, so we don't know what it looks like, and when I went to a, uh, participated in a, ten, ter cent, ten, ter cent, ter, a, a three year anniversary of the death of Hook, someone made a, a very nice representation, that, that's Hook. And we managed, by the way, there's also no, there was no, mem nothing of anybody to remember Robert Hook, and finally, uh, uh, the group persuaded the Westminster Abbey to put a little plate. So it's a little plate. If you go down the, the, the line, uh, you will find uh, at the end of it a little plaque with Robert Hooke next to his uh, uh, mentor there. Now, here's the importance of 1679, okay? Hooke was a uh, secretary of the Royal Society and uh, he wanted to make peace with Newton and he also wanted to start a new conversation with him so he wrote him a, a letter no emails at the time a slow letter you see it and said I let you know let's let's continue to talk about physics and 
he also particularly didn't like, Newton didn't like that if he talked to somebody, he, what he said would be spread around, so he promised not to spread around. Hooke, of course, never kept any promises like that. In. As, soon as, as soon as Newton made any mistakes, he would tell everybody, you know. So he said, look, uh, Isaac, tell me, you know, what do you think about this idea of mine of thinking about motion not in a continuous force. It's hard to, men to mentally think of a continuous gravitational force. I think of it as a bunch of impulses and in between the periodic impulses in between uh, the, the, uh, the object is traveling at a constant velocity. So uh, I don't know how to put this in mathematical form. You're the mathematician. Maybe this idea of mine can be uh, transformed in some kind of a mathematical language. In fact, everybody who does numerical computation, in fact, is doing what Hooke says, because you know, a numerical computation is split up in a series of delta t's, finite delta t's, and final impulses. So it, it was a very natural thing to do. But the misfortune is that Newton, uh, that Hooke didn't know how to express it in mathematical form. And as soon as Newton heard about it, uh, he, in fact, went to work. Uh, so here is suppose that there should be a thousand of these pulses. In a second of time, there must be, if the, if the body receives it, thousand pressures within the space of time, then maybe we can understand why planets move around the sun. Now, Kepler had it all wrong. He had the idea, but he thought that the, the impulses were tangential along the motion. Uh, and as I say, uh, angels, instead of pushing the planets along the motion, push the planets towards the sun. Think of, a, think of a bunch of, say, tennis players in a circle, and they are told, they, they, they get a ball, and they are told to hit it towards the center, so the next player gets the ball, and he hits it towards the center, and you'll get eventually the ball moving around a circle, right? So that was Hooke's idea, and he asked Newton to implement it, and he did. Now, there's, I think I will probably want to skip this. Be before Newton had uh, you know, that idea, it doesn't mean that he hadn't thought of ways to, of implementing it. And I wrote some papers, uh, you know, some 20 years ago, and how he implemented them. He used the idea of curvature, a very different idea, in how to express the motion. Uh, and uh, he said in a, in a letter to uh, the famous Halley ha ha from the Halley com Comet that the simplest case for the computation was to consider the motion with a constant uh, uh, gravitational force. And you just, I spent just uh, half a minute on it. It turns out this is the picture that is in the corner of a letter to Hooke. And you can see that, in fact, if you have the idea that you can, by some curvature method, you can trace part of the, part of the motion from the biggest distance of the object from the center to the closest distance, okay, let's say on the constant force, then the next branches of the orbit can be gotten by simple uh, by simple mirror reflections of this, and I did this some time ago, and sure enough, I think the next picture will show you that if you do this, you can get an, an orbit by reflection of these curves, uh, which perfectly matches the, the original one, well, perfectly well it matches, but that, that way of thinking that Newton had before Hooke, didn't provide him with any insight of the basic uh, idea that 
that was provided by, by Robert Hooke. It, it has nothing to do with the concept of, of impacts at periodic, at periodic times. So it was basically a dead end for Newton. And when he had the idea, you know, he, he couldn't pursue it any further. I do, want to, I, will, I do want to point out that there's a, the historians don't look at the original diagram and they paint, the, they paint the, a, a, a diagram which has a fundamental error in that it claims that the orbit is closed. Well, it's very important that that orbit doesn't close. In fact, that orbit that Newton was talking with constant force, as you probably know, well, it doesn't have an analytic solution. Uh, it's very confusing. In terms of the calculus, that's not a solvable uh, analytic problem. And uh, well, here's a curvature, but I, as I said, I'm not going to discuss it. Even great mathematicians like, uh, you know, Arnold from the uh, Kolmogorov, Arnold theorem, uh, was flabbergasted that Newton didn't get the right angles. He said, I mean, you know, I mean, Newton's angles give an impossible orbit. Well, Arnold again was thinking that Newton was solving the differential equations that Newton didn't have. So, now the historian, you know, in this case, a very good mathematician who was interested in history, but you know, missed the point that that's not how Newton did it. Well, if they are interested during the question period, I'll show you how he did it, but I'll skip that. And so, this was a question that Oh yeah, later, well, the, the second, the second uh, date, 1684, is when was the beginning of writing the Principia. So five years after Hook, Heinle came to visit Newton and asked him, well, if you have an inverse force, what's the orbit? And Newton said, of course, it's an ellipse. And then, well, how did you do it? Oh, wait, wait a minute, I'll, I'll, go in. I'll go to my papers and I'll, I'll show you. And Newton claimed he couldn't find the papers where he had worked out the solution. I claim that Newton didn't have a solution to Heinle's question. He had a solution to the inverse problem. He could tell at that point how to solve the problem if you have an ellipse. Elliptical orbit where the center of force at a, at a uh, focus that the forces has to be inverse square, but not the opposite, not the contrary, which became an object of controversy too. Now, uh, I learned about a diagram of Robert Hooke uh, among his manuscripts in the Trinity Library. When I found out about it, I called up the library and said I'd like to come and visit uh, and look at the manuscripts, that Ryan said, who is Robert Hook? I mean, who, who is this guy? I said, oh, you know, you have a whole set of manuscripts. When I got there, sure enough, they handed me, you know, they're, they're, again, the statues, monuments to Newton and everything else in the Trinity Library. They had a little, you know, a cardboard box about this size with the manuscripts of Robert Hook. And in fact, what was in it was typed in a letter on top of it a day before I arrived. They, you know, nobody had looked at anything there. But here is a diagram. It looks very com complicated, but you can decipher it from what Hooke said, where he actually implemented Newton's idea. In my opinion, is that the moment that Hooke got a hold of the initial preprints, you call them preprints or initial drafts of the Principia, he immediately recognized that Newton had solved this problem. And he implemented it, and here he solved the problem of the motion, not for inverse square forces, but the other motion when the force is not towards the focus, but towards the center, okay? So he, he solved the problem of what happens when the force is directed 
towards the center. Okay. Newton has always was, had something nasty to say about Hooke. He didn't have the geometry to do it. He told Heine later on, but it's clear that he had the, he had the geometry with a little a assist from Newton. And in my opinion, if he had published, he had, had he published this, he could have had a little footnote, you know, acknowledged the thank you, thanking Newton for his help in solving the problem of motion in the history I think would have been completely different it's a long story that he didn't publish this darn thing uh, part of it is that uh, here is by the way the, the diagram ripped off of all the auxiliary lines you see that he in fact worked out and, and in this case and that's remarkable that for the case of the Center, when the force is linear towards the center, the vertices of the impulses lie exactly on an ellipse with the ellipse with the center at the center of force. That is a very interesting result. And Hooke did all that, published nothing. So for students back there, see what happens when you publish and perish. Here's a, here's one of the canonical cases of publish and perish. He didn't publish, he, you know, he's forgotten. Now, I, I, for fun, I said, let's, talk, let's take Hooke's calculation, but instead of having impulses that are linear with the distance, make them inverse square force. And lo and behold, the calculation diverges because you get too close to the center. In this case, of course, it's a, an ellipse with the center of force at the focus. And when you get too close to the center, the inverse square force, the impulses grow too rapidly. And I think that, well, you see, it all has to do with initial conditions. And Hooke, unfortunately, used poor initial conditions for this problem. And I suspect he may have tried this and discouraged it discouraged him because he couldn't understand why it worked in one case and didn't work in another case. And like, you know, he just didn't publish it. I mean, he said, Newton, you know, admitted that his exchanges with, with Hooke direct him in the, send him in the right direction in private correspondence, but he never admitted that in public. I mean, he never acknowledged it in his, in his book. And of course, only historians read the correspondence and everybody forgets that without Hook, nothing would have happened. Well, we can forget this. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a a couple of minutes, uh, a quick rundown how you draw the, the orbit, okay? I mean, assume that, assume that, uh, see how you can do this, you can do that with a pencil and a ruler, that's all he had. That's why I call it an atelier, it's all graphics. Here's the sun, okay? And let's say the planet is at A, at a certain distance. And now, assume that the planet has an initial velocity that takes it to the point B, there's no impulse, nothing, okay? So it moves inertially in a straight line. When it arrives at B, after a interval of time, like infinitesimal or whatever, there's an impulse. And the impulse, of course, is towards the center. Okay? So, now, you do two things. You have an impulse, thanks. You have an impulse towards the center. <coughs> which I call VB. So this impulse has some, has some line, okay, because there are no vectors here, it's just geometry. So you express everything by displacement, 
and the direction has to be towards the center because it's a central force. Meanwhile, if there are no impulses, the body would move to little c, where this distance here is the same as this distance here. Okay. Next. You have to combine these two displacements and if you combine them vectorially it's equivalent to a parallelogram and you add them up you go from B to capital C right well guess what repeat you repeat this say four times you get the next Four ver three vertices, right? Of the orbit. Because each time you have to do the same operation. Initially you have an initial velocity and you repeat it. And if you look at the Principia, the diagram there, in the first proposition is this diagram. Excuse me. So, It's the same as the diagram I just showed you. Now, let's see if this works. Well, it's not supposed to be a video, but it's not. It's not uh, working on the on this. Uh, Oh yeah, there it is. So I made a little video of what I just showed you, okay? And you can again see the same thing and how easily it all, it all, I mean, the whole idea is this, this is any, any student in high school can reproduce now the orbit. All you need is a pencil and a ruler. After all, that's one of the tools that Newton did. If you have it, say, let's see, can I have a few minutes to, to show this, okay? Uh, so, I want to show you that you can really do this in a completely elementary way. Just repeating what I said, okay? I timed it, so it's only a few minutes. You know, that's, the, that's the impulse, right? Now the magnitude of the impulse is arbitrary. You, you pick it. Depends on the magnitude of the force. You have, in every problem in physics, you have not only the equations, but you also have initial conditions. And now once you do it once, then of course you repeat. And I've got the video accelerated. And after you do this four times, okay, you get the diagram Newton. The important thing is that diagram is not a, just a, a, a figure to, to prove a theorem. It's actually a way to, to do things. Now comes the important thing. Why would you stop? Why would anybody stop at just four impacts? Why not just continue? I mean, look, there's nothing special about four impacts. So, let's see what happens if you, if you take a lot of impacts. And in fact, the, the, the force that we're talking about, the constant force, is exactly the force that you have when you have a ball rolling in an inverse cone. The transfer force is a constant. And this very elementary calculation reproduces, reproduces fairly well, it reproduces fairly well 
I mean, I did a little stero stereoscopic picture of the orbit. This is, a, this is experiment, the observation. And you can get this orbit by this totally elementary graphical procedure. And you can see that it obeys Kepler's law because uh, if you have the, the cone vertically, then angular momentum is conserved. And you reproduce all these things very nicely. Well, you can convert all this to your traditional analytic form that you have in the textbooks and you get the traditional, but you don't get the traditional Euler equations. You might think that this is just Euler's equation. Turns out you get a much more sophisticated pair of analytic equations, which have this, the nice property that the area preserved. There's a symplectic algorithm, an algorithm which, by the way, has been rediscovered numerous times in the past without anybody, practically nobody realized that they were reproducing Newton's original method. In fact, recently I talked to the author, one of the authors, and everybody knows uh, the numerical recipes, you know, a fat book about, uh, and it doesn't mention <laughs> Isaac Newton's contribution, mentions secondary uh, contributions. So here's essentially <coughs> F equal MA, or so on, which is simply transforming uh, into vector notation the, the geometrical equations. I think for fun I showed you the original uh, the original uh, as I said all this stuff is online and you see here a diagram again surprisingly this diagram is drawn to scale it's not a drawing it's an actual diagram corresponding to what you have in the Publish Principia. And here are many other examples. This shows you more directly that a ball rolling in an inverted cone is calculated very accurately with this pencil and ruler. And you give the problem to a graduate student in mathematics and he can't really give you an analytic solution. I mean, he can't, he, all he can do is do numerics. By the way, you cannot only do the elementary problem of a force that is a constant. Of course, that's, uh, that's the simplest problem in graphics in the atelier. But you can do it with inverse square force. You can do, and you can get nice elliptic orbits. And even you can do it, you can even put an inverse cube force. And as some of you know, there's a theorem in the Principia that says with an inverse cube force, the orbit is a spiral. Okay? Newton. But I don't think that Newton got these results by thinking. I mean, he did all the graphics, he saw all the things that came out of it. And then he converted that into rigorous mathematical proofs, which are very obscure, and there's no hint on, I think, the way he got the results. Another interesting question, I guess I'm going over time now, another minute or two, okay? Uh, I think I'm about ended. Another interesting question is, the convergence of this method, well, you know, you have to do this, you have a certain magnitude of the, the each step. Now, surprisingly, convergent. If you, for instance, take the initial conditions, the initial displacement, and you take, instead of the original magnitude, you take half of it, and always you take a smaller interval, of course, the impacts have to go a quarter of the magnitude because they quadratic and the different colors tells you how rapidly the, this graphical procedure actually converges. The method is time reversal. It, uh, yeah, just let it.
I think it's my last slide, and I think it's very amusing that even the emperor, even, even uh, Napoleon was interested in, in these things. In those days, <laughs> figures like that were interested in physics. <clears throat> so he, he had a little reception in which uh, Laplace is now is a very uh, honored scientist, was asked by uh, Napoleon, where, 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 what about, where's God in all your calculations? Because, you know, people then insisted that this was all divine revelation and God had a role. And I think I like, I like Laplace's answer, you know, I don't need this particular hypothesis. I recommend highly, if anybody is interested, to uh, uh, read uh, Bernard Cohen, who uh, uh, has a very good uh, uh, guide, you know, simple on all these theorems. Well, thank you very much. So Pierre is asking about the, your, your notes, notes up here, which are in English. Uh, the Principia was written in Latin. Yeah. So uh, isn't there a disparity? So Between the Latin and the English? Well, or, well the or first the manuscript, it said the first manuscript sent to the Royal Society was in English. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Pierre says, is it true the first manuscript sent to the Royal Society was in English? English, yeah. English. Yeah, you can go, we can go back to it, but they were, they were in English. He, he wrote in English. It's only when he went to the Principia, I think he put everything in Latin. Another, another way to keep, you know, they don't scold us from, yes, yes, yes. from bothering him with... And then it had to be translated into English. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we were talking about this earlier, later, that it was... The, the Latin was later translated into English, but the best translation was actually done into French by Emile de, by Emile de Châtelet, who was uh, a companion of Voltaire. And uh, it's a fantastic, uh, I, I think it's a much better translation than the, uh, than the translation from Latin to English of Mott. These, these uh, diagrams, you see they, they're always ending up as, as uh, uh, being uh, as, sort of swirling in, which I, I presume is if they made this step smaller and smaller, they wouldn't. Isn't that right? No, no. That's a fairly accurate solution of what happens if the force is an inverse cube. If a force towards the center is inverse oh, right. cube, it either spirals inwards or outwards. And no, no longer, I mean, the diff, the, there is a, a limit of central forces, and the inverse cube is one of the limits. So beyond uh, an inverse cube, there no longer are any, any uh, orbits. All the orbits are totally divergent. But the inverse cube has two solutions. One is inwards, and the other one is not. Now, it's something very surprising. Mm -hmm. If you look at proposition, 41, in connection with this, uh, you would think that Newton, in Proposition 41, where he actually gives a, uh, supposedly the solution of the inverse square problem, uh, uh, he gives, he says, well, if you know how to integrate integrals, or he calls, uh, if you know how to get the area of my equations, you can solve the problem. You would think that in the examples, he would give the inverse square force. And he doesn't. He gives the inverse cube. Uh, 
And again, it's one of these things Newton would have had to give Bernoulli the credit because Bernoulli was the first one who solved the Newton's equations for the inverse square force for this, the, the inverse solution. But my opinion, he, he Newton didn't want to give anybody credit for anything. So he would avoid that to the extent that he wouldn't do the obvious thing in that problem. BJ, do you have a question? Yeah, let's see this. In one of your slides, you showed Professor Cohen, uh, I guess, uh, complaining that the worksheets of Newton were missing. Yeah. What is the evidence that they ever existed? No, I mean, the, they are missing in, according to uh, Ivy Cohen. Oh, if they never existed, in that he never did any of this. Is that what your question is? Yes, that's the question. Now the question the is, evidence. maybe he didn't do any of this. Yeah. Okay. You, you can have it that way. I mean, that, my whole point is, I mean, the point of this lecture is that if he didn't have any, anything before the Principia, then I believe he had divine revelation. Because, you know, how do you sit there and come up with things like conservation of energy, angular momentum, all the nice things that you know about, 92 theorems, and you just, you know, scratch your head and you write down the theorems and, you know, that's not the way science is done by anybody. And I think Newton is not an exception. He, he had, you know, he stood on shoulders of giants. Uh, and, I mean, I mean, you don't have to believe anything that you heard today. I mean, it's just, uh, I think it's a better story than to think that he just got it all out of thin air. Oh, so fall the shibboleths. <laughs> so, in this five-year period you concentrated on, uh, how well was F equal MA understood? When did F equal How well was F equal MA understood? In other words, the relationship of force and acceleration. Yeah. Well, F equal MA, let's, let's forget M, because M, yeah. uh, for, for this, for the problem of static, There's central force M doesn't enter. So. Right. BJ's question is the relation between force and acceleration, right? I mean, uh, why would the force be proportional to the acceleration? Where in the Principia is F equal MA? I assume it's there somewhere. Which proposition? Well, if you, if you read Proposition 6 in Newton's Principia, he has F equal Proportional to acceleration. He writes the acceleration geometrically. Yeah. So, so that that, that was in, uh, that was but, out, but, there, out there at the time that these constructions yeah, were. Yeah. Now, of course, Newton has to give a rigorous but, proof. Okay. He he gave a rigorous proof of his theorems, and he wrote down an expression for the central force, starts with an impulse, and then, he looked the, and then he took the limit of the impulse. I mean, the... the well, I'm getting at, understood, but, the, but whether the, the full expression of what you're talking about is the consequence of what you're talking about, or the precursor of what you're talking about. That's my question. So BJ is asking where the idea came from that force causes acceleration. Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, that's the question. So while he's thinking, I can mm. swear it's generally. I think, well, uh, let me try to, uh, if you do this thing geometrically, you notice that what the force does is simply, it changes the velocity. So you have essentially, not the acceleration, it's just you have a, 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 an instantaneous change in velocity. Okay? Now, an instantaneous change in velocity, if you want to convert that into a continuous change in velocity, you have to divide that by the interval between impulses. And that's where the acceleration comes. You, you need to, you, you need, if you know, if you want to look at this problem, this geometrical way, 
and you want to make the impulses occur at shorter and shorter time intervals and go to the limit that the time intervals go to zero, you then have to take that limit, which is the acceleration. Yeah. Radial direction. And and you didn't describe how much instantaneous change of position you use when you make that construction and how it depends on the nature of the force. So, so to well, translate right, did you hear? So he's BJ says the diagrams you showed show an instantaneous change of position. And you didn't explain what the rule was for that. Uh, uh, what, what I said, what I said is that what you have to do mathematically is, is say if you take half the time interval, you have to change the impact by a quarter. Okay, you have to always realize that it's quadratic. Okay? And that is equivalent to introducing in the limit the concept of acceleration. Listen, there is a humongous literature on what is rather a completely trivial answer to your question. Uh, I mean, you, you know, there are tons of papers on it, and I think it will be very hard to, to convince you right now, but, but the trick is that the impacts have to be de decreased quadratically in magnitude when you decrease the time linearly, okay? Because you know, it is a, it's a second order differential equation. I mean, that, that's the answer that I can provide right now. Let's see. Uh, further questions? One back here. And so this uh, graphical method that, that, uh, that you're saying that Newton used for, uh, uh, for, for numerically calculating orbits for these different forces, uh, for, for the small uh, central directed motion, uh, how would he have uh, constructed that? Uh, is it something that he would have come up with some sort of uh, like a geometric construction for how to uh, get an inverse cube or inverse uh, square displacement? Or would he have just measured it with a ruler? Or what sort of uh, techniques would people have used at that time for making that? So the question is, when you're doing the ruler construction, how would you put in the... Uh, Radial dependence of the force. How do I put in the? the yes. No, oh, that, that's a very good question. I, in fact, I, I'm going to give you two answers. First of all, uh, the force depends on the distance. After an impact, you are at a different point and you are at a different distance. Okay. So let's say you have an inverse square force. The impact now has to be scaled by the change in the distance to the center from the previous impact. They will take the ratio, uh, say if it's inverse square, you take the ratio of the inverse square of the two distances. So, you know, a little bit more sophisticated, if you have a force that depends on distance, you change the magnitude of the impacts according to the relation between the force and the distance. But it's, okay, so you need a little, Maybe a little hand calculator. I'm cheating a little bit. You need a little hand calculator to do the ratio if you can't do it by hand. Uh, well, well, okay? What? what? How would he have done that calculation? Would, would he have uh, you know, done, done it on paper, you know, using figures, and then used a ruler with markings on it? Or would he have come up with some sort of a geometrical construction, construct an inverse square? Or have, what, what technique would he have used for doing that? So the, so the question is, how might he have put in this dependence? Would he, for example, have calculated it out on a piece of paper, or was there? No, you can't calculate. What you add, you no, know, you, you do the little graphics. I cheated because I did it only for constant impulse. Okay, now suppose that you do it for inverse square force. Okay, so let's say you go from from the first impulse to the second impulse. Okay, the second impulse, the distance has changed. Now I take my calculator and I calculate the change in the impact according to the law of force. 
point is that he, did, he didn't have any calculator. <laughs> well, he did it by all. I mean, Newton was fantastic. I mean, he could do those things. Uh, I mean, we could calculate square roots and all that. I mean, you know, uh, you look at his papers and he calculated logarithm, logarithms to 92 decimal places. I mean, uh, that, that was a piece of cake for Newton to do calculations like this. But you know, the high school student, either he knows how to for uh, quadratic things, he should be able to do it uh, by hand. If he doesn't, he can still use his calculator to do it. But that's that's how it's done. Now let me let me say one more thing about it because there's something very interesting, and uh, this occurred to me later. Now suppose that I'm mean, only talking about impulses, but suppose that there's friction. And incidentally, uh, people who want to stay around can play with. Uh, with an inverse cone and a, and a steel ball, I have there a, a, a prop. Now there's friction when you have a ball rolling in an inverse square uh, ball. How would you introduce friction, which is a more subtle force? You can introduce it with impacts. But I, it, I found a very neat way to do it. I said that you take the distance between impulses to be equal, right? But if there's friction, you should scale the distance between impacts according to the amount of friction. And I got beautiful results for that problem, because every time the thing goes around, it doesn't come back to the same distance from the center, and it works. I mean, all you need to do is just find out what the I mean, by observation, you can decide what the coefficient of friction is of that particular cone. Well, it's still there, but uh, it's it's gone. All right, but well, we got it there. So the inverse cone over there, uh, did Newton use that, or who was the first person to use that? Who was the first person to use the inverse cone? Wow! I didn't say I didn't say that. Oh my God! That's what Robert Hooke did. He actually, I don't know, yeah, magic, did okay. That did it also use Somebody, that? So, is that your system, not mine. That goes on and on. Robert Hooke played with a cone. And that cone, by the way, I built it so that it would represent Hooke's uh, cone. Did it also uh, use other shapes? Excuse me? Well, well, let me talk about the cone. Let me talk about the cone. He, he saw Newton. Newton presented him with his diagram in the corner of his letter. By the way, that diagram I showed you is in the corner of a letter. And it's, it's an extremely small, maybe a few inches size diagram. I mean, you know, the guy was incredibly fantastic. I say, uh, everything he did, he did marvelously. But uh, Hooke saw that. He saw, saw that calculation, he said, he said, Newton, I've seen that, I've done that. This is a, this is a ball rolling in a cone. So he immediately recognized that Newton had done a calculation for a problem that he had observed experimentally. So did he also use other force laws, like the quadratic? Uh, did Hook use other, is that yes, the question? That's the question. Yeah. Well, I said earlier, that had he done that, and had he tried, I, I don't know, I didn't, see, I didn't see anything in that little set of manuscripts that he had tried. But had he tried with the same initial conditions, he would have found that the whole thing diverges. And my suspicion is that happened. And he couldn't figure out why it was diverging, not realizing that he was using initial conditions that led to, see the initial conditions alone, in the magnitude of the impact tell you where the eccentricity, the eccentricity of the lips depends on those conditions. And in a numerical, in analytic, in numerical calculation like this, or numerical calculation too, will diverge. If you have, you know, if you come too close to the central force, because the central, uh, near the central force, the force will diverge, right? So, uh, poor Hulk, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
Cambridge uh, Trinity College, where they have the Trinity Rock, they also have, I think, some of the letters between Hook and Newton on display. And I remember seeing one that had the Earth-shaped object, and Newton was explaining how an object would fall to the center of the Earth in the trajectory. And there was some debate that Hook complained that this was wrong or so. Um, so I was wondering if there are any blunder and whether you admitted that you admitted that what was known about that. Okay, so the question is whether there are documents, let's say between Hook and Mr. Newton, showing it, Newton admitting that he screwed something up. The new, new drew something? Yeah, so the, the, new, it was, the question is, are there any documents where Newton writes the book and confesses that he screwed something? Oh, absolutely, none at all. And, and, and I'm sure that the, the, the Newton will never admit to Hook. In fact, on the contrary, Newton kept saying that Hook can't, can't do anything. I mean, Hook is a, a schmuck, you know. Uh, and... and, and uh, Look, uh, frankly, uh, I think it's well known that Newton was the greatest scientist of all the time, and he also was had the worst character of any science of all the time. I mean, he was a really bad character, and he never credited anything to anybody. I mean, you know, there was only one scientist in the whole life of Newton that he seems to have respected, and that was Christian Huygens. But otherwise... <coughs> He dumped on, 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 on lightness. Uh, yeah, it's a long story. I mean, it delights historians. To, are there any historians here, by the way? Uh, I can speak freely. <laughs> anyway. Well, let's see. Uh, Almost, okay, I think no. it's... Are there any more questions? All right. This is good, because I was going to cut off debate anyway. Uh, let's thank Mike for a lovely...